All right. I'm John Gustafson. I've uh, been at a lot of companies. I've been at about four universities, uh, three national labs, and something like a dozen companies over the years. I think that's one of the reasons that Shaheen asked me to come to speak is because of that, that, uh, that experience. Uh, I've I had a number of job titles, but I think the one I like best so far is professor, because that's where I am right now at National University of Singapore. Um, if anyone wants copies of the slides, I'll be happy to share them. I've got them on a flash drive ready to go. So here's the synopsis of what I'm going to talk about. The evolutionary change versus the revolutionary change. The evolutionary change where we think we're used to, we think we know all about Moore's Law, but big companies still fail because change is hard for them. Even when they know about it, they still can't seem to do it. Startup companies tend to succeed because change is easy for them. And a revolutionary change, there's a couple examples of this that I've seen in, in the years I've been in computing, which is about 40 at this point. Uh, and there are opportunities for startups. Anytime you have a really sudden wrenching change as opposed to one that you can gradually deal with. So one of them was parallel computing, and the other was, I think, about to happen, and that's arithmetic. And that's, I see signs of that happening all over. So I will conclude by talking about what are the sure signs of a startup opportunity that might succeed. So here's my experience sorted by, computer, by company size. And as you can see, it goes all the way from uh, the, one of the software companies I started called Parallel Solutions back in the 80s to uh, Intel with, I think they're over 100,000 employees. Every time they get over 100,000 employees, they have layoffs. So they get spooked by that, that number. So they always clear out about 10% of their, their people. These numbers are when I worked there, not their present size. But uh, it's quite a range. And here's the interesting thing I took away from this range. Political squabbles are equally likely to happen at all sizes of company. You'd think that small companies where you know everybody and you all form together, that that would be free of political squabbles. Not so. Even when it was two people, when it was just me and my wife, we divorced. OK, so that was a political squabble. You can't even keep two people together. They put out a software company. Anyway, part one, Moore's Law and its victims. No other industry improves at this rate. We've all heard it, but it's worth repeating. There's just nothing that goes at, at, at the rate of uh, a doubling every two years, which is the real Moore's Law. You've heard a number of versions of Moore's Law. The popular version, which is incorrect, is that speed doubles every 18 months. And that was actually said by a marketing executive at Intel. It was not what Gordon Moore said. What uh, Gordon Moore said was that the number of transistors that is most economical to pack into a chip doubles. He initially said every year. Then they got more data points. He said every two years. And Carver Mead was the guy who said, let's call that Moore's Law. And was sort of self-reinforcing. There's been an awful lot of papers about this. But uh, it's important to understand what he said most economical to produce. If you, if you put too few transistors on the chip, it would be too expensive for a transistor. And you'd be sorry you hadn't put more in there. If you push too hard, however, it becomes expensive for other reasons. So that's what's driven that chart there. And I guess the uh, Intel processors are in blue, and other people's processors are in red. But they're all tracking about the same rate. And we expect, the, of course, this to tail off. And uh, the, the, the joke is that the number of people who think Moore's law is coming to an end seems to double every two years. So maybe we are going to finally hit the end of Moore's law. But many companies have failed because they denied this curve. Even though we all know about it, they still have not made business decisions that seemed like they were in keeping with it. By the way, this is from Moore's original paper in 1965. He said that someday, circuit miniaturization would allow personal communication devices. He didn't say cell phones. Of course, we didn't know exactly what they'd be like. But he envisioned that we would all be able to carry cell phones. And as a joke, his article had this cartoon of a kiosks at a, at a shopping mall where you could buy notions, you could buy cosmetics, or you could buy handy home computers. And he's holding it up there in the center, which is, of course, exactly what you can do right now. Anyway, here's arguments that I've witnessed at more than one company. Somebody says, you know, our parts cost is dropping by half. And the executives say, great, our gross margins will go up. Uh, no, we need to lower our product price. No, we can't. Our revenue will fall. How would we support our sales force with a lower price product? But there's a startup making a product that's cheaper than ours. <laughs> Those guys, their product isn't even compatible with ours. They, can, they can't run our software. They're, people are locked into our software. That company will never take our market share. And I wonder if they're hiring, because it's only a matter of time before they do take your market share. This same mistake over and over and over again for 30 years. 
Here is the innovator's dilemma, examples from HPC. And you may have been at the supercomputing conference, I think it was about four years ago, that Clayton Christensen was the keynote speak speaker. Wonderful talk. He drew his experiences from the, the steel industry and to some extent from the personal computer industry. But I, I think I, what he's done is, is actually, when I applied it to, to HPC, I got all kinds of good examples. IBM ruled the mainframe market in the 1960s to the 80s. And Univac and Burroughs were really distant competition. And DEC introduced these affordable mini computers and, and innovative software that was completely incompatible with IBM. I mean, it didn't even run EBCDIC for the character set. It used uh, ASCII characters and things like that. The floating point was incompatible. It was just all completely different. And they did some very clever things, like they would allow pieces of a PDP-11, a computer, to be purchased for no more than $5,000 per piece. You could gradually, that happened to be the price point at which one person in a university could make the buying decision. And so 10 university professors would get together, they'd each buy their, spend their $5,000 and put it together and they'd have a, a departmental <laughs> computer that they could use. And they didn't have to go through uh, accounting. IBM laughed at DEC's offerings, of course. They saw no competition from DEC and they didn't want the low profit margins in that part of the market because that's a, just a silly little part of the market after all. And of course, DEC mini computers got more powerful. The VAX 11780 sold hundreds of thousands of copies and uh, it took away mainframe sales because they were so popular. Every university in the country got a, 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 a VAX from, from digital and digital became the second largest computer maker. Uh, IBM almost ran out of money in 1993. In some kind of tell-all novels, we found out just how close IBM went, came to going completely out of business around 1993. They only had like three months left of capital before they would have to declare bankruptcy. But of course, they did not allow anyone to know that because that would have hastened it and <laughs> caused people to abandon them as a source. But they managed to clear out a lot of their waste and, and, uh, and recover barely in time. But I sense that IBM is still struggling. They are no longer uh, anything like what they were in the 1960s to the 1980s. So what happened to digital equipment? Well, they ruled the non-IBM part of the market, certainly. And Startup Sun Microsystems offered this low-cost microcomputer that could run the Unix operating system. Well, of course, DEC laughed at Sun's offerings, and they saw no competition. They didn't want the low profit margins in that part of the market. And so the disruption was that Sun's microcomputers got more powerful and more expensive. And pretty soon they were selling hundreds of thousands of those and taking away mini computer sales. And Sun became a billion dollar company in record time. And I think there's gotta be at least half a dozen people from Sun here in the audience, so I'm telling you stuff you already know. We all, we, a lot of us lived through this period. And digital equipment fell apart. They did not survive this particular disruption. They were acquired by a PC maker to their chagrin, I'm sure. The great digital equipment corporation, you know, acquired by Compaq. It had to be uh, a little undignified at the time. And of course, that was later acquired by HP. Here is Sun at the heart of the dot-com bubble. And that's from 1987 to 2000. Now notice that the vertical scale is logarithmic. This is their stock price. And that's right when I joined Sun into the valley. And that's what happened after that. So I don't know if there's a cause and effect relationship, but anyway, I certainly got to write it all the way down. <laughs> and that was a shocking time to come into a company that had that thought everything had it done was right. Success is a very poor teacher, very poor. If you've gone up, you think everything you did was right and everything you did was brilliant. And I think that got to the founders of Sun, uh, McNeely and friends. They thought that they had done everything right. It turned out they hadn't done, but they were, they were in the right place at the right time, so they su succeeded despite having done some, some dumb things. And some of those dumb things came to haunt them, and that's, of course, when they, they, didn't, they didn't keep up. Now, a lot of this is because people, as I say, did not recognize the Moore's Law effect going on. Oops. So what happened to Sun? Sun ruled the workstation in the Unix server market, a $10 billion a year company, right? Intel started introducing these microprocessors that claimed were fast enough to use in servers. And you might remember when Scott McNeely laughed at Intel and said that Sun's products were like a mansion, but Intel's were like a trailer park in your backyard. And they, you know, who would ever want to run something like Linux when you could have Solaris? Okay. Intel servers started beating Sun's performance by 4x or more for a lower price. And I was keenly aware of this because I was at Sun and I was responsible for maintaining the relationship with the HBC software suppliers, the ISVs, who did things like the, the, 
all the EDA software for the circuit designers. And uh, you know, we were always concerned when anybody beat us in a mark benchmark. And whenever Intel went up against us, they beat us by about a factor of four. And we, we hoped and prayed that our lock-in on the, all of the CAD software would keep us there for a while. But I warned people at Sun, you know, that's not going to last forever. And it didn't. And Intel now has 99% of the server market. That's the Tianha supercomputer, which is still number two on the list. Uh, just a whole pile of Intel processors and a few accelerators. Huh. So Sun burned through its cash reserves very quickly and had to be acquired by Oracle, as we, as we all know. So what is happening right now to Intel? And Intel, of all companies, should understand Moore's law, right? So Intel still rules the PC and the server market. Steve Jobs asked Paul Odellini, this is when I was there, I think. No, it's just before I got there, to make a low-power processor for their upcoming iPhone product and maybe their iPads as well. What did Odellini say? He said, come on, we don't have any interest in those low-cost, low-margin processors. We want $500 and up for our microprocessors. We don't want to build a $20 processor for your silly little mobile products. So Apple went to ARM for its processor design. And the iPhone went and took over the world. And Android phones, of course, and tablets now all also use ARM. And that's taking sales away from personal computers. Because gamers now use their phones to play games way more than they use PCs like they used to. So Intel stock now is right about where it was in the year 2000. They were once the most valuable company. It's the way Apple and Google are now. Odellini was replaced as CEO five years ahead of schedule. Normally, they take him out to the age 65. They have every other CEO who's ever worked for Intel. Unlike any other uh, person who's worked for Intel, I believe uh, Paul was not invited to join the board of directors as well. So I have a feeling they were upset with the fact that he didn't say yes to Steve Jobs when he was invited to build processors for the iPhone. They didn't see it coming. They didn't want to go lower in performance and price, and they did not ride Moore's Law down. When I was there, people would use the phrase, only the paranoid survive. The problem was, they got it exactly wrong. What Andy Grove meant was, make sure you embrace change before your competition does. Be always anticipating what's going to happen to you. But what every Intel employee meant when they said it, and I was there, was, don't rock the boat. It's scary out there. Just keep doing things exactly the same way forever, and, and don't change anything because uh, we, can't, we can't afford to take any risks, which is almost exactly the opposite, of course, of what Andy Grove meant when he wrote that book. They really should read the book, but they, they didn't. They read the title of the book. All right, so part two. I want to talk about two revolutions. One is parallel computing, which we can almost use as a model for what happens in a revolutionary uh, disruption to the market, and then new arithmetic, which I think is about to happen. So here's some early history. In 1940, the very first electronic digital computer was the at Nassau Berry computer, and it was actually had 30 processors in it. This is not generally appreciated. It was a SIMD machine, 30 parallel processors. He showed it to John Mockley, and of course John Mockley said, whoa, digital, hadn't thought of using digital. He would only been thinking about analog computers up to that time, but he knew how to get government resources and went and of course built the ENIAC uh, as a result of getting those ideas. And that was a very serial machine. But the original machine was actually a 30-fold SIMD, <laughs> a SIMD machine. 1948, von Neumann is, of course, influential in building a lot of the follow-ons to the ENIAC. And they saw, decided that EDVAC uh, would be a serial computer just because it would be easier to build. But he, at the time, said, we'll build a parallel version later. Of course, that's not exactly what happened, because once you have a serial model and you've coded software to a serial model, what is a hardware vendor going to do except build stuff that can run all the existing body of software that you've built up? So it's self-perpetuating, it's self-reinforcing. But it's, of course, harder to build a fast machine, and as people demanded higher and higher speed, you just almost had to go parallel. So by 1967, this got, it, it got so obvious you needed to go parallel that uh, the university people were trying to experiment with parallel machines. And it's, it's often the, the university people are the pioneers. The Illinois, uh, University of Illinois had a series of ILIAC machines. And by the ILIAC 4, they were putting together, they wanted to go up to 256 processors, each of which would be a borough's mainframe. And you can imagine all these things lashed together by university graduate students. It barely held together. And fortunately, they 
they uh, they attempted to build just one fourth of the machine, 64 processors, fill, fill a room this size. Uh, and Gene Amdahl had recently finished the IBM 360 design, and so they staged a debate between Dan Slotnick, who wanted 64 processors going at once, and Gene Amdahl about the merits of parallel computing. And Amdahl presented what we now call Amdahl's Law at that, at that conference. And what happened was that people said, now we've got something that we can use to deride parallel processing with for, for all time, that parallel computing can't possibly work. And they would cite Amdahl with a fortress they could hide behind. They said, we don't have to change our software. Amdahl's law says it'll never work. But it's, it's the memory limits that lead us to revolutions like this, because the crossover was right there at the ILIAC-4. You see that point there at 1970? It took one microsecond to fetch an operand out of DRAM that was built by Intel. These were the 1K DRAMs, the very first DRAMs you could you could buy. And the ILIAC-4 was the first to say, let's instead of using magnetic core memory, let's build the whole thing out of DRAM. And that was very fast. But it also took one microsecond to do a multiply add. And it was the first people had seen the, the possibility that you could actually do arithmetic faster than you could fetch something out of memory. And now it's a very large ratio. It's, it's it, almost 100 to 1 is the ratio between fetching something, uh, the time it takes to do that out of main memory, not cache, versus computing. That is what causes revolutions, is you're not just writing all the, the same specs down. The bandwidths do not, do not change the same rate as the transistor density. That means you have to keep doing a new architecture all the time in order to be competitive. You can't simply scale everything uniformly. And that's what leads to revolutions. But from 67 to 1984, there are all these research products, uh, research things that people were doing. Uh, I think that's the ILIAC-4 on the left. And uh, there were parallel processing conferences, lots of enthusiasm, but it got a kind of a cold fusion reputation as a crackpot idea that would, you know, wave of the future and always would be. They made jokes about parallel processing would never actually become mainstream it would, because it was just too unreliable. Uh, they didn't really understand how to deal with race conditions, for example. So uh, you have shared memory, two, two processors right to the same location, and they tried to prevent it simply by being careful, which didn't work very well. I had some collected quotes. I've always enjoyed these quotes. Uh, at a conference not unlike this one, there was a guy from CDC touting the Cyber 205, and they put up a, a speaker put up a list of the, the vector mainframe price divided by performance and that of parallel computers. And of course, the parallel computers were beating the, uh, the mainframe, but he didn't understand that smaller was better. So he said, your price performance numbers are out of date. I just recalculated them. They're even higher now. And everybody roared with laughter. And he said, what would I do? You know, he looked around nervously. Nobody, and I mean nobody, knows how to program these big parallel computers. Seymour Cray said that in an interview with Business Week magazine around 1980. And if God had meant us to use parallel processors, he would have put brains in our wrists. An IBM vice president said that. I think he later on went on to, I'm pretty sure it's uh, Paul Masano. Paul Masano said that. So he later went on to become the CEO of IBM, but he certainly did not believe in parallel processing. And something really revolutionary happened. This is, the, this is what happened that, that triggered all the startups. And this was called the Cosmic Cube at Caltech. And they originally wanted to build it out of ray processors from floating point systems. But uh, Intel came in with an 80% discount and took that business away from FPS. So they decided to build it out of 8086s with the, uh, the coprocessors, the 8087s. And this thing was you know, 700 watts total to six cubic feet, sat on a little bench, incredibly small. But uh, you know, for only fifty thousand dollars at the time, they were equaling the speed of a Cray One, and that's when people suddenly started paying attention. And they did it not just on like one silly application; uh, they did it on a whole range of applications. Pretty soon, they had hundreds of examples of things that this thing could do. They originally built it for quantum chromodynamics, and they wanted to build a you know just three-dimensional uh, X Y Z physics simulations, but they found it was actually good for an awful lot of things, and it was actually more robust than the Cray. So FPS, Amatech, NCUBE, and others just popped up like crazy to start going commercial with this idea, because it was easy. If you, could build a, if you could build a working processor board, you could figure out how to put a bunch of them together inside of a cabinet, and you could actually make it work like a high-speed computer. Now, one thing I like to point out to people is that Fox and Sight did not invent the Cosmic Cube. That's what they called their machine. The graduate students encouraged them to call it the Cosmic Cube. 
I, I suspect that Fox and Sites didn't know what that was all about. The Cosmic Cube was invented by Stan Lee. Okay, it was in a Tales of Suspense number 79. And if you've seen any of the movies, the Avengers movies, or the Captain America movies that got this blue cube, that is actually a hypercube. And that's uh, a device created by a secret society of scientists to further their ultimate goal of world conquest. Kind of fun to know. Anyway, that was the turning point. So we took the, uh, the N cube with 1,000 processors and showed that there was a flaw in MDAL's assumption. And people were furious. It was a really interesting emotional reaction. It was a cognitive dissonance. They'd convinced themselves that parallel processing didn't work. And we had all these examples where it was doing fluid dynamics and structural analysis and acoustic wave simulation. And it was 1,000 times faster on a 1,024 processor system. And uh, it's, it's funny how some people react with anger to having, having their mindset disrupted like that. We got nasty letters for even, even saying that uh, perhaps Amdahl's law was not a good guideline for how to, what you could do. But that was at the point where suddenly all the big companies started introducing processors that were based on that kind of approach. And startups popped up like crazy. And some of the stodgy computers died because they, they didn't move fast enough. And in about, by 2003 now, Intel said that clock speeds are tapped out. They spent a lot of time teaching people to buy processors according to their clock speed. And, and people did. And then they had to backpedal and said, well, OK, we can't make the clock speeds go up, so it's, we're going to be putting more cores per chip. Microsoft said, stop that nonsense. Hell no, we're not going there. We're not going to program Microsoft Word and Excel in parallel. So just give us more clock speed, please. And <laughs> there was a little bit of a fight there. But by 2015, all the major universities were teaching at least a realized model of parallelism. There are two holdouts, and they're still holding out. Stanford and Berkeley. I can't believe it. But if you go back to the history of physics in the 1920s, there were some very you know, stodgy uh, universities like Oxford that did not believe that quantum mechanics or relativity could ever possibly be true. That was a bunch of nonsense, and they would stick with Newtonian physics forever. Uh, oddly enough, even Stanford and Berkeley sometimes get caught in that, that reactionary mindset. So here's some quotes from the 1990s. Compare these. The processors in the Intel Paragon are connected in a two-dimensional mess. I got that from an Intel sales brochure. I love that. It's so true. I think it was a typo, but <laughs> anyway. And a Ford guy said, there is an enormous opportunity for performance reduction using parallel processing. That's also true, but it's not what he meant. <laughs> if you don't do it right, that's exactly what happens to you. It was a mesh. Yeah, he had a two-dimensional mesh. They meant to say two-dimensional mesh, but it came out as a mess. Uh, we want to get into parallel processing, but we want to do it one step at a time. And the Craig guy didn't realize the irony of saying it that way. But that's always one of the one that he, I always giggle every time I hear that statement. OK, so here's the generalization of the alternative to Amdahl's law. Every technological advance is eventually used to do more work in the same amount of time, not m the same work in less time. So you think about that. When there's a big advance like, uh, say, integrated circuits versus discrete transistors. People think they're going to be simply building everything to be smaller and cheaper and, uh, and do things in less time. But no, they simply pay the same amount, build something the same size, and it does a whole lot more. For here's an analogy. Uh, here's what printing looked like in 1970. I see a number of people that might remember when printouts looked like this. All capital letters, equal spaced, hard to read, light gray on lighter gray, fan fold paper. And uh, what happens in around 1962 or so, uh, it, IBM realized that lasers could be used to print an entire page at once. And they started to work on, on research on laser printers. And I actually toured the IBM plant when I was seven years old. I saw the laser research going on. I always remember seeing this with my own eyes. So they thought they were going to build a laser printer that would spit out pages like that three per second. They would shoot out of the machine. That's what you'd use better technology for, was to produce the same crap, but much, much faster. And of course, what we have now is we still wait 30 seconds per page, but look what we can do with it. We can do full color printing, double sided, full bleed, and do graphics and high resolution stuff. And that's because we all live at the same rate. We eventually want a machine to do something that we're willing to wait for it in human time scales. So, hmm. 
I thought, you know, it's time to think about what should we do with computer or arithmetic now that we're going so much better with all this technology. And that is going to lead me into the next section. Here's where we are in 2016. Some of the big problems we face are the energy and power. We've got this budget right now for what we can do uh, with, to get to exascale. They don't want to spend more than 20 megawatts on an exascale system. That means we better get 50 billion operations per second or else it's not exascale. There's never enough bandwidth, the, the memory walls we call it. And the arithmetic is incorrect, although we've gotten used to that and so we don't complain about it. It's not just inaccurate, it's downright dangerous for non-experts to use. And it's starting to, people are starting to realize that this is getting in the way of us getting to exascale, especially as they do things like deep learning. So too much power and heat. There's a, the size of a heat sink that goes with one of our chips these days. They show you the little chip that's actually a, it's accompanied by something that's about a thousand times as big. And uh, that's what the data centers are looking like these days. That's about, I think, 10 or 11 football fields area of computing hardware used for a data center like uh, the ones that Microsoft has run Bing and so on. And the biggest line item for Google, I understand, is their electric bill. The biggest single line item is pretty incredible. Of course, you also want mobile devices to last longer. So it's not just the big data centers, but it's also everybody just carrying around a cell phone. The, it's really the enemy of HPC because if you have heat intensity, that means you've got to build something bigger because you have to remove the heat. As soon as you put things farther apart, you're up against the speed of light, and that means you're increasing the latency, and that reduces the speed. So, this is from, uh, oh, what is this, about 20, I'm trying to remember what year this data is from. It's a little bit out of date. It's about three years out of date, but it's still pretty close to the truth. That a, a multiply add, you know, takes 200 picojoules, if you just count the arithmetic, and not even fetching it out of wherever you're getting the data from. But uh, if you're reading from cache, maybe four times that much energy is just to get it out of cache. Moving it across chip, like from an L3 cache, would be more like 2,000 picojoules. And executing instruction, there's a lot of control and fancy stuff like look ahead and branch prediction and all that other junk that uh, really adds a lot of power. But you're still seeing high speed. But then you have to go outside the chip and go to DRAM, and you're at 12,000 picojoules and 70 nanoseconds at best. And you notice that that means you're spending about 36 watts at 3 gigahertz just to move stuff back and forth between DRAM, which you're doing just about every clock cycle. You're loading the entire cache line every single clock cycle or, or sending things back. And the real problem there is that an awful lot of that data, especially for our community in HPC, is double precision numbers, 64-bit precision used for everything, just as a guard. So here's what computers looked like in 1980. Remember those days? Some of you weren't born yet. And there's what computers look like now. That's a million-fold improvement in Moore's Law, which in the case of these two would be a thousand times faster and a thousand times cheaper. What does arithmetic look like? Well, yeah, they're in color now. So that's it. Otherwise, we have not done a thing with the way we store floating point numbers, which is a format that actually goes back to 1914. So World War I is dictating the way we represent numbers on computers. That's the era we're drawing from. That's pretty ridiculous. I mean, to, to be still using something from 1914, the only thing I know that's lasted from 1914 in our industry is the QWERTY keyboard, the layout of keys. We're still doing things that way. Other than that, we've really understood that we need to replace our old ways of doing things in order to get to current computer car capabilities. Let me talk about the uh, Ariane 5. This is a, uh, the European space, uh, equivalent of the space shuttle. They had a 64-bit float measuring the speed, and they shoot the thing off, and it put, was put into a 16-bit guidance system, and it had been going fast enough that that really didn't fit anymore. So $0.7 billion was gone in seconds, and that was as a result of just not understanding the way floating point numbers scale and how they're fitting, fitting into hardware. Big, big capital loss. So why are programmers managing storage? I see a revolution underway. And that's why I say this is an opportunity for startups because this is going to happen. Here's a, a, a situation where rounding error killed 38 people. In the first Gulf War, they turned on the, uh, the missiles, the Patriot missiles that were going to defend against uh, the scuds that Saddam Hussein had. And they just left them on, you know, waiting with their fingers perched on the red button in case they needed to fire. But in 100 hours, uh, they were measuring time in tenths of a second. How many tenths of a second go by in 100 hours? I think it's, uh, it's 3.6 million. 
So you've got this really big integer part leaving a little fraction part. There's not enough precision for the fraction part, which is what you need for the guidance system. And so the guidance is off by 0.43 seconds. A scud can travel a kilometer in 0.43 seconds. So the Patriot missed the scud, and the scud hit the barracks and killed 38 people. That was a floating point single precision error. One more, because these, these are, I think, intriguing, because people don't think about just the massive amount of loss you can have from floating point arithmetic. This is a Sleipner oil platform in the North Sea, and what it looked like on August 23rd of 1991. That's what it looked like the next day. It uh, fell to the bottom of the ocean, caused a 3.0 earthquake in doing so, and uh, destroyed, let's see, about a billion dollars. In 2015 dollars, it's about a billion dollar loss. Now, this, to be frank, was not exactly caused by floating point arithmetic, but more the trust in a structural analysis program being, which was not being used properly, it was NASTRAN. And they hadn't figured the shear strength on the concrete but you can see where if you had a, a, a more reliable arithmetic that was maybe would tell you how inaccurate or accurate it was, you could save things like this from happening. So I've got this idea that, you know, we've always had a better way to represent real numbers. When we say that pi is 3.14, that's wrong. But if we said it's 3.14 and we put those little three dots after it, that's a true statement. Well, computers can easily have a bit that would then record, is this an exact number or an inexact number? And you can actually do correct mathematics. I don't want to get too much into this, so I'm going to go through this real fast because that's not the point here is to talk about startups. I just want to tell you that there's a revolution happening in arithmetic enough that you'll see that something's, something's up. And th these are what I call universal numbers or unums. And it's a superset of the IEEE standard. The IEEE standard is looking very long in the tooth and everybody's starting to break it right and left. Google's making its own number formats when they do uh, deep learning. Uh, ARM, when they do uh, the 16-bit version of floating point, they say, well, let's throw out the IEEE rules because they're really stupid at 16 bits. You can do much better than that. But the thing about units is that they don't have any rounding error, and they don't overflow, and they don't underflow. And at first, I know that sounds incredible because it's a finite number of bits, but there is a way to do it mathematically using that dot, dot, dot uh, idea. And you can get bitwise identical answers, which we have not had in IEEE. IEEE floating point is not a standard. It's a set of recommendations. It's guidelines. And you can easily be completely conformant with all of what IEEE tells you to do and get different answers, even on the same system, run twice, depending on whether uh, something got kicked out of cache or not. It will actually affect the answer you get. It uses fewer bits, which is, of course, a relief for the memory wall. And they're new. So here's where I hit that sense of, oh, I've been through this before. People say, we don't like new. Uh, in particular, the CTO of Intel didn't like new. He said, well, you can't boil the ocean. And that's why I said it. I would put a picture of the ocean boiling on the cover of the book that I wrote about unum arithmetic. And there's my plug for the book. Anyway. So here's three ways to express a big number. In the bad old days when you had to do it with integers, it would take 80 bits to express that number. There's the IEEE standard float. There's what it takes with the unum. You actually add additional descriptive information, and it allows you to shorten the amount of uh, information necessary to represent the float, because it, it, it captures how accurate or inaccurate is this. Do you really need this many bits of exponent? No, you don't, so you can shorten those. Do you need this many bits of fraction? No, you don't, so you can shorten that. And this is a startup opportunity. And I know of at least one startup uh, that's, that's thinking of doing something with these. You know, actually, I think I know of two so, uh, that are thinking of putting this into the native hardware the same way we have native hardware for floating point right now. So Rex Computing is represented here by the two founders, Thomas and Paul. And uh, <laughs> sitting in the front, I didn't even know they were going to be at this, this talk when I wrote these slides. And they have received venture capital funding to build a new processor. It's probably been 40 years since anyone in Silicon Valley received funding to build a new microprocessor. I mean, what VC would say you can compete with Intel and AMD and Qualcomm and all those people, but th their story is so compelling, they got funded. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what they can do with it. They said they want to implement a human arithmetic in their next generation machine. They're, they're, they're pretty psyched about that. Their, ex their prototype that's taping out right now may be 20 times more power efficient than ARM. So in that sequence of things that I showed you, you know, what's happening to Intel, Intel's being taken over by ARM, you might also look ahead to who's going to stick it to ARM eventually. 
<laughs> so they've got it back, and it's, I think they're barely starting to test it. They're waiting for the boards that, that hold the, the, the chips. So I'm thinking, will ARM laugh at their products saying they don't want that part of the market? You know, okay, you know what happens after that, right? So deep learning and big data, I think, are the killer apps for these lower precision. You want to be able to go much, much faster when you're trying to teach the systems to, let's say, distinguish between a dog and a cat image. Just even simple things like that can take days and days at petascale. And uh, since floats can't go down that low, you, you, can't get, you just can't get the speed up. So about six groups are telling me that they're starting commercial ventures with unimal arithmetic. So part three is short. Let's see, how am I doing? I'll be fine. So how to spot a computer startup opportunity? You can almost get this from what I've, I've led up to with these anecdotes. First of all, you see it, people who are denying a technology trend. If you see a prevailing company, one that's really dominating the market right now, but they refuse to follow Moore's law, price curve, they concentrate only on the highest margin part of the business, like Clayton Christensen warned us, uh, and they, they don't see that something's coming to undermine them, and there's probably something that you could, get, you could be one of those disruptors. They think that they have a software lock-in that will give them higher profit margins. Software lock-in lasts maybe two years. But as soon as something becomes about four times better, people will jump ship, even if it means rewriting software or doing a lot of conversion effort. You, you only get that locked for a little bit. Uh, if, they, if they dismiss smaller and cheaper solutions as non-competitive, sure sign something's about to happen. So that's the opportunity. Be one of those people that attacks the prevailing company and disrupts them. And uh, coming from below is, is the safest way. There are companies that, that successfully disrupt from above as well. It's rare. Uh, Tesla Motors would be a good example of disruption from above, where you come in with a much more expensive product, and people dismiss it as, well, that's, way, that's a really expensive thing. No one will ever buy one of those. And, but it's important that, they, that the existing companies just dismiss you out of hand as not, not being important or not ever going to be competitive. Then there's the class of cool ideas that don't quite work with yet, but the main thing, no one else wanted to be the early adopter of the clear speed accelerators, even though accelerators were a good idea. That's when they should have said, we've got to do something different here. We've got to reprice or retarget or re completely different design. So I guess the only real way to know is try it and see how the market reacts. Oh, I'm sorry, I was pointing right there. I think I understand your question. Different uh, applications have different degrees to which they require absolutely valid solutions. If you're doing something like weather prediction, you may be tolerant of, of a, a, some slop. Uh, if you're doing searches, let's say, you don't mind if the ranking is not absolutely perfect. But if you're designing a nuclear reactor, or if you're doing, uh, designing a, a turbine blade for, for, <laughs> for a jet engine, you're very fussy about getting it exactly right. People die if you're wrong. So I think we should be able to adjust the, the level of arithmetic to whatever is needed where there's a speed and quality trade-off. And if you want, just want fast but sloppy, you can have that. If you want perfect, we don't have adjustments right now in our existing arithmetic. It, one size fits all. This is what you get. This is what you